Oversoul 7 and the Museum of Time by Jane Roberts, read by Martin John, Chapter 12, Window Speaks for Monarch and Seven is Worried. Window, who still thought he was Christ, kept staring sadly at George and asking, Are you Judas? Even as Seven hustled him and Gregory Diggs into the small sports car. No, he's a friend, Gregory kept repeating each time Window asked. They were all crowded in the car together. Josephine wrinkled her nose at George's hairy and sweaty thighs and yelled over the sound of the motor, I borrowed John's files. She waved a folder. The car windows were all open, but it was still stifling. George looked anxious. Windows, Christ face, was calm but resigned. George started driving up Church Street and asked rhetorically, Well, what now? Let's eat, Seven said. Why not give Window a good meal in a restaurant? He missed supper at the center, didn't he? And then we can figure out what to do next. I don't know, Josephine said dubiously. Why not? Gregory demanded. He could stand a treat. He's not going to embarrass anyone, if that's what you're afraid of. Yeah, what the hell? George said, grinning. I've never had dinner with Christ before. Josephine glared at him. Seven grinned. Window, in his Christ voice, said, I hope it's not the last supper. It's not easy being Christ in this day and age. You just think you're Christ, Gregory said reproachfully. I thought we settled that when we had our talk. Well, that isn't easy either, Window said, intelligently enough, Seven thought. You all eat, Window continued cordially. I'm fasting. George was relieved when everyone decided on the next restaurant they came to. He was tired, wondering what on earth he was getting into, and John Window disconcerted him. For one thing, Window looked innoxious enough, and George had rather expected a more wild-eyed man, even though in the dentist's chair he'd been mild enough. But George hadn't heard of the healing then, and knowing about it now made him expect Window to demonstrate some bizarre behavior. Damn, he thought. Anybody who could say he was Christ. If Window believed it, why didn't he do something now while George had an eye on him? They filed into the restaurant. The minute they sat down, they were all gripped by an air of expectancy. All but Window, who smiled amiably and said to Gregory Diggs, I knew taking me away from the center wouldn't work that they'd find us. Yeah, Diggs replied dourly. Let's decide on dinner and then talk, Seven said with a brisk smile, because he was uneasy himself and wanted to discover why before anything happened that he couldn't control. They were silent, reading their menus. The restaurant was quiet, with only a few patrons. It's quiet in all the local restaurants, George said, too loudly. Everybody's at their cottages. Josephine Blith ignored the statement, wet her lips, smiled earnestly, and said to Window, John, do you believe you're Christ right now? John, George muttered, grinning suddenly. Of course, John, no need for formality. We're friends, aren't we, John? You remember, we've talked before. And suddenly, 
with Josephine's question, the area of interest shifted to John Window. He had the floor and he knew it. He even smiled in acknowledgment. Until this point, he had been almost unreal to them, hardly a person at all. In a funny fashion, he seemed almost anonymous, particularly for someone causing so much fuss, Seven told Cypress later. And she replied, Of course, it's too bad you didn't understand why then. Verily, John Window said, I'm John Window who thinks he's Christ, or I'm Christ who thinks he's John Window. This is a dilemma to me and, I understand, to others. I'm a man of strange education. That is, what I've learned seems to have been taught to me someplace else, and I'm quite articulate. Gregory has taught me to come out of the closet, as they say. I've been a closet Christ, or a closet John Window. I'm not sure which. Does any of this answer any of your questions? He started to eat his meal. He'd ordered fish and chips after Gregory talked him into fasting tomorrow instead. Dr. Josephine Blith smiled professionally. You're doing fine, just fine, she said. Gregory was quite taken aback. You don't sound crazy to me, he said. You sure as hell sound strange, but you make it sound as if there's sense there someplace. I've considered all of this often, Window said, looking at George. It's a particular position to be in, particularly since I think that Christianity has done as much harm as good. It's seen its time. So why would anyone want to be Christ in this day and age? You tell me, George said, a trifle embarrassed. Window's eyes never left George's face. Finally, George blew his nose. They'd all heard John Windows speak at least briefly before, but now all of them at the same time were struck by a clear, transparent quality in his voice, as if each word he spoke was somehow inevitable and meant for them alone. Josephine struggled to maintain her professional, superior stance. Very good, John, she said, in a condescending voice. George muttered, Damn. Gregory Diggs said to all of them, What did I tell you? John Window wore jeans, a sport shirt, and sandals. George stared at him. He didn't look any different from any other male in the room. Indeed, looking at the male patrons, then back to window, George had the weird feeling that something in each of the other men's faces was somehow reflected in windows. Yet window had his own features. Light blue eyes, medium complexion, rather thinnish lips, and the proportions were all normal. Yet granting this, George thought stubbornly. Window's face still had a quality he'd never seen before, and that was why he couldn't get a handle on it. Window was saying, I know when I think I'm Window, and I know when I think I'm Christ. What really gets me thinking, though, is this. Who is the me that thinks I'm either Christ or Window? Probing question, John, Josephine said in a bubbling voice. But it was no use to pretend. Whoever or whatever he was, John Window was beyond today's psychology. It couldn't explain him, she frowned. Something else was odd, 
Two, they finished their suppers. Usually a waitress would come over, but their table seemed isolated in some fashion that she couldn't explain. She almost wanted to pinch the table to see if it was alive. Another thing, Windows said, Christ is able to heal people, but he's paranoid. He really believes he'll be crucified. Window can't heal, but he knows that somehow he has access to that ability through Christ. And Window is sane enough. He's scared, but he isn't paranoid. Who's speaking now? Oversoul 7 asked quickly before anyone could interrupt. You spoke of Christ and Window, so who are you? Complete silence. George held his breath. Josephine nervously scratched her stockinged leg. Window Christ looked the most astonished of any of them. He started to speak, faltered, began again. I'm not sure. I think my name is Monarch. Or I think it could be. Now and then I think to myself as this person. Monarch, Seven gulped. Of course. It was possible that, with psychological bleed-throughs, such a thing could happen. Josephine opened her mouth to speak, and Seven's suddenly commanding glance stopped her. He said, All right, Monarch. Can you help Window or Christ? George and Gregory Diggs were so fascinated that they couldn't take their eyes from Window's face. George muttered, You mean he's somebody else, too? Shush, said Gregory urgently. Listen. I am Window and Christ, Monarch said in a distant voice. And suddenly Window's face did have a someplace else look. Or I was, Christ is a Window who heals. Now the voice was hesitant, as if the words were coming from far away and had to be translated. And yet, again, each individual word was clear and oddly transparent. So transparent seven thought, too late, that they could all fall through the voice if they didn't watch out. No one was completely sure exactly what happened next, although seven had a very good idea, but it was one that even he had trouble accepting. First of all, there were changes in perception. The things in the environment remained the same. Yet to George, Josephine, Gregory, and Seven, each detail in the restaurant seemed suddenly more empathetic, more itself, brighter, more separate on the one hand, yet impossibly more a part of the entire environment. George happened to be looking at a glass sugar bowl, for example, and his eyes widened as it seemed to attain a different reality than it had only the moment before. The sugar glistened, tiny dazzling crystals, each individual and somehow perfect, mixed in with each other, each crystal touching another, flowing into another while retaining its own sparkling apartness. Besides this, the reflections on the sugar bowl itself became almost dazzling, seeming to belong to the bowl, to the stained glass, while simultaneously dancing above or even within it. George felt as if he were being hypnotized. Diggs had been looking at the toe of his right shoe. Suddenly he saw it as he never had before as if it was the most significant thing in the world, simply because it existed. The shoe seemed planted in time, in space, solid leather resting on the wooden floor. 
yet it also seemed composed of thousands of specks of light, each separate yet making up the entire structure, lights interlacing and dancing within themselves, and moving with the reflections from the restaurant lights, which also seemed somehow to belong to the shoe. Josephine's eyes had been on an edge of the menu striking out between a napkin holder and a ketchup dispenser. Before she realized what was happening, the letters on the menu seemed to leap upward, almost as if they were written in the air above the paper. She even swore that she saw shadows fall behind the letters for an instant before the perspective of the entire menu changed. That is, the menu now appeared to form itself about the letters so that the word bacon not only seemed alive in the strangest fashion, but seemed to form the rest of the menu around itself. Each word made the menu pucker or change, as in turn each word became prominent and the others faded from the view almost completely. Then, she gasped, all the words came into prominence at once, so vividly that she could hardly bear to look, and each word had a hand in forming the menu upon which it was written. George Bainbridge had been staring rather impolitely at the spot in the front of John Window's mouth where he'd removed the bad tooth. The gap was quite noticeable, and George was idly thinking that after he took out the one beside it, he'd fit Window with the bridge. Just about then, his eye roamed toward a good tooth on the other side of the gap in Window's mouth, and what happened next left George literally breathless. I almost peed in my pants, he said later to Josephine, who wrinkled her lips distastefully. That one tooth instantly took all of George's attention. He felt the life of the roots beneath, of the nerves, the rich bed of gums, but more. The tooth seemed to form the gums as much as the other way around. No, that wasn't it, he thought, struggling to understand. It was as if the tooth had a part in forming the gums that would later hold it so snugly. As if ahead of time the tooth, knowing its reality, demanded a mouth to hold it. All of these changes began as the man who now called himself Monarch said, Christ is a window who heals. And to Seven, it was as if the man had two sets of eyes, or rather double vision. Seven saw the restaurant, precise and definite, yet the effect was as if he were looking through the small end of a telescope one that probed into time instead of space. At the other wide end, the full-sized, flesh-and-blood monarch of the twentieth-fifth century looked out at the expanse of the landscape outside the museum. He was talking to himself, except that it was John Window's monarch in the restaurant who spoke the actual words Seven heard. How strange to find myself in such a place and time. I feel that I lived in Christ's era and in the 20th century and in the 25th all at once, as if I'm a set of different selves, but with one slightly out of focus. I wonder how many other people have felt this way. A pause. Through the double vision that Seven saw in Window's eyes, he saw Monarch smile, just as Window's seemingly miniature face did at the same time. 
Maybe Monarch is a future self to other portions of my entire selfhood. Maybe Christ and Window made my existence possible. And vice versa, Seven whispered, wondering if both or only one Monarch would hear him. Of course, said Monarch in the restaurant, mouthing the words of the twenty-fifth century Monarch, who now mused to himself, Perhaps I even had a hand in initiating the codicils that I uncovered in my own time. The codicils, Seven said urgently. Quickly, tell me about them. They're the basis of our civilization. Without them, the world would never have survived, mused Monarch in front of the museum, as Monarch in the restaurant spoke the words. A feeling of panic almost washed over Seven as he saw the implications of Monarch's answer. He asked quickly, When? When did they originate? The answer came, In the time of the George. With those words, the alterations of perception vanished. John Window said, I forgot what I was doing. George Bainbridge just shook his head and muttered, What the hell just happened? He was staring at Window's mouth, which now appeared quite normal. I don't know, said Josephine, blinking at the menu, which also looked quite ordinary now. And Gregory Diggs shook his head wonderingly as the tip of his shoe lost its magic. Window thought he was Christ again. He said morosely, This could be a modern version of the Last Supper, don't you know? I know you're my dentist, Dr. Bainbridge, but are you certain you're not Judas too? Now cut that out, George muttered, but softly, not wanting to make a scene. I'm sure. Take my word for it, will you? Verily, Christ said. Super, George replied with a sigh. Do you remember saying you were monarch? Seven asked. He tried not to look worried, but he had an idea that there were more time bleed-throughs than he knew what to do with, and he wanted to question Window or Christ or monarch why he still could. I think Window must be a catalyst of some kind, Josephine said to George. I've got to tell you what just happened to me. Ditto, George said. I mean, you won't believe. Window, did you do something to my shoe just now? Gregory Diggs asked. Seven tried to cut in on the conversation or rather to put a temporary end to it so he could question Window. But Window promptly answered Gregory, No, you just saw it the way it is, he said, almost apologetically. Things were complicated enough. I mean, they are. But sometimes I think I'm a future man named Monarch. When I think I'm him, people sometimes see things as they really are. Sometimes, he said slowly, I suspect I have to go beyond Christ to something else. But you should have said something, Josephine said. I'd have, uh, understood. Honestly, John, she reached over and touched his hand. Window looked momentarily disconcerted. He lifted his other hand in the air, as if unsure what to do with it. Then he gently placed it quickly and lightly on top of Josephine's. Her face got so red that George thought she'd suddenly developed a fever. She gave a funny, muffled gasp, pulled her hand back, and just stared at Window who said, I was just trying to help. Well, I don't need your help, she whispered fiercely. 
Now, what the hell is going on? George asked. Touch fire and you get burned, Gregory Diggs replied, grinning, but good-naturedly. Now do you see, Windows said, I've hurt her feelings. That's another thing. Sometimes when I touch people, they touch themselves or get in touch with themselves, and it makes them angry, and I never know when that's going to happen. Josephine grabbed her white beaded pocket book, sprang to her feet, and walked as quickly as she could to the door. It was obvious that she was holding back tears. George Bainbridge, looking bewildered, followed her. Now what? he said as she opened the door. She leaned against the outside of the building, dabbing at her eyes with a handkerchief. He just did it again, she gasped. Only this time, well, he picked up a secret of mine and told me not to worry about it. But he didn't say anything, George protested. Just touched your hand. Yeah, well, that was enough, she said, in an almost harsh voice, abandoning her ladylike manner. George grinned. And there's more. What are we going to do with him? I'm humiliated. I've learned more about him tonight than I have in our three official appointments. And I can see now how I put him down and programmed him to say what I wanted. George, he isn't crazy. That's what frightens me. And I could tell when he touched me, he was sorry for me, for not knowing how to handle it all, for being scared when he healed me of that damn headache. Uh, I've forgotten that part, George admitted. What the hell, though? That was super. Gregory thinks that about his gums, too, but it makes me nervous. If someone can heal you, well, they must have some kind of power over you, mustn't they? That scares me, too. Come on. Healing a headache can't be all that bad, George said, jokingly. Then, with a playful leer, What's the secret he discovered? It isn't funny, she said glumly, and something else. He's only been at the center three months since I was appointed. His records say he committed himself. His parents are dead. I don't know where he came from, what section of the country or anything. I just think it's damn weird. They stood in the summer night darkness, watching the traffic speed by the parking lot. The air was somewhat cooler. Josephine pulled her summer jacket tighter, and George's legs were getting goose pimples, the tiny hairs sticking up like wires. Damn, I'm getting chilly, he said. I don't know what the hell to do with window. We have to get him back before eleven, though, didn't you say? Josephine blushed. Actually, I signed him out as a guest at your place to cover his absence, she said. I mean, he's a man. I didn't want to sign him out to my place because people might talk. You're devious, George said, grinning. What are you saying? We should take him to my place? I mean, we're covered? She nodded. I hope Jean doesn't decide to surprise me and show up. The fewer who knows about this, the better, replied George, looking worried. You mean you haven't told your wife? Josephine asked disapprovingly. Told her? Hell, I haven't seen her in three days. She and the kids are at the cottage, George answered. His eyes widened. 
for the first time he found himself wondering about the old arrangement. They go over every summer, he said almost defensively. In his mind's eye he saw his wife's face, and at the same time he was uncomfortably aware of his growing pleasure with Josephine's bliss company. Uh, we better go get the others and get out of here then. Hmm, she answered. There's something else. I don't know what happened to you in there, but I had some changes in perception that I, I'd assigned to drugs, except I didn't have any. God, my peers would think I was out of my mind if they heard this. Pure power, huh? George replied, but he was growing more aware of her closeness, so he swung around almost burlesquely and opened the door. Seven's face told George that something was happening. He'd never seen Seven look so serious before. Gregory Diggs was obviously listening intently to whatever was going on. George pulled out Josephine's chair for her, for the first time, and sat down himself. Gregory Diggs whispered, Window is monarch again. It's wild, listen. Window, as monarch, had a bemused expression on his face. He looked at Seven and looked through him at the same time, as if caught up in a spectacular daydream. The twenty-fifth century monarch began to stroll in the direction of the museum. He felt an odd disquiet. He wondered, for the hundredth time, what had given him the idea to dig at this particular tell in the first place. And as he thought, Window as monarch spoke the words in the restaurant, I was wondering what actually gave me the idea for digging at this particular tale to begin with. What's he talking about? George asked Gregory. Diggs shushed him. In the background, a waitress was clearing the tables, and George leaned closer so that he could hear better. The codicil's origin could have remained a mystery, monarch mused growing still more uneasy. Or worse, I suppose, they could have never been discovered. But what about our world, then? Without the codicils, God knows what fate would have befallen the species. And again in the restaurant, his eyes looking nowhere, window as monarch spoke the same words. Then his words suddenly became urgent. I've got to check the codicils again. I don't know why, Monarch said, and he began walking as quickly as he could toward the museum. Even the Monarch speaking to Oversoul Seven grew agitated, and so did Seven. The museum in the 25th century correlated with George's house. Seven knew that he had to go there right away, and that Window had to go with him. It's all right, Seven said to Window, who now was silent. We'll work it all out. We have to. Work what out? asked George, sounding irritated. Seven had been concentrating on Monarch's words so intently that he hadn't even realized that George and Josephine had returned. Now he looked up at them all in sudden dismay. How could he explain what he'd just learned? What delightful human companions they were! He looked at them with a fondness that surfaced so surely that its expression was obvious. George looked embarrassed. Gregory somehow understood. Josephine blushed. But the expression of such emotion frightened George, so he said, alarmed, What's wrong? Not a thing, Seven said briskly. 
only we have to go back to your house quickly. I'll explain later. Right now, we haven't any time to lose. George shrugged and said, Lead on. Nothing would surprise me now. Josephine picked up her purse. Diggs took Window's arm protectively and, though he was still trying to look unperturbed, Oversoul Seven was almost beside himself with worry. If they didn't find the codicils in time, this world of Josephine's, George's, Gregory's, and Windows might not exist at all, or it might turn into another probability, or lead to a future probable world in which the earth lay in ruins and Monarch himself did not exist. Window walked along docilely enough, but would he be strong enough, Seven wondered, to do what must be done. All of Seven's sense of urgency couldn't keep the group together much longer, though. Josephine Blith insisted they rest for a while. She went home in a taxi. George took everyone else to his place. He went to his bedroom purposefully. Oversoul Seven fidgeted and waited while Diggs and Window drank coffee in the kitchen. So everything was quiet, but not for long. In Chapter 12 Peace, Light, and Love. Aloha.